So it's my pleasure to introduce Peter Altenburg. He's with uh, the IBM Berlin lab in, uh, in Germany. And he's kindly agreed to share his uh, experiences working with Omnet in modeling uh, cloud systems. Currently, Peter is responsible for processor performance <coughs> verification and modeling, but in a previous life, he did this piece of work. And uh, we were all very interested to, uh, to learn about that. So, Peter, please. Thank you very much. Thank you for the kind invitation. So, <coughs> the topic is cloud performance simulations. And uh, to start uh, with a bit of background, I would like to introduce you to some uh, some general per cloud performance scalability issues. Um, I guess not everyone is <coughs> deeply involved in cloud development here yet. And then we go to uh, general, uh, some general remarks on cloud performance simulations. And then I would like to introduce you our performance simulation framework for cloud that we did over several years, worked on this jointly with uh, Wolfgang and uh, Tibor from Kushikon from the lab. And uh, then we go and apply this uh, to uh, a special case, the uh, simulation of open state image deployment. There are finally some thoughts on where we are and what is to do, where are the challenges. Okay, so let's start uh, <coughs> cloud performance scalability. Um, so if you look at this slide from uh, Werner Vogels, you know him probably, he's a chief technology officer of Amazon. And uh, these are if you like, the top uh, known functional attributes of clouds. And you see that uh, here we have performance number one and scale number five. I'm not sure whether this really means that this is the most important, um, <laughs> but maybe I guess this is the most important. <laughs> um, so it's clearly something you have to look into. And um, another uh, bunch of folks from Berkeley, they also mention here the importance of performance availability of clouds in their view, uh, a Berkeley view of cloud computing. You see here at least 10 items, five are related to uh, scalability performance. Mm -hmm. And you know all this stuff like here from uh, how important performance at response time, for example, is for uh, end users, etc. And another important ex aspect is economy of scale. Um, that is leverage in cloud computing uh, here slide from, uh, oops, from uh, uh, James Hamilton, who is vice president of Amazon, <coughs> responsible for data centers that you see can be much more uh, efficient in terms of economy uh, if you have very, uh, if you do these data centers at very large scale. So <coughs> for example, here you have some estimates uh, number of hosts in various uh, data, cloud data centers. And um, then if you think about uh, what workloads they have to deal with, uh, you can come up with estimates on the number of mobile systems, which is, of course, clearly connected to cloud, mobile cloud, uh, are very much intertwined. And then you come up with uh, what does it mean in terms of iOS per second, and uh, <coughs> what does this mean in terms of disk, what the, and then with the disk you have to associate the nodes and the network device, etc. And then, of course, the problem comes uh, if you, how can you design uh, such uh, enormous cloud data centers, and how can you manage this at this scale? And this is something which is, uh, I think, of course, you can do a lot of experiments, but it's clearly something where modeling and simulation uh, has an important role. 
another complexity is not just the size, but also you have an elaborate stack. I mean, probably most of you have seen this, where you start here at the bottom with infrastructure, compute node, network, etc. Here you have the infrastructure as a service level, <coughs> like Amazon software, OpenStack, etc., where you can ask for virtual machines and stuff like this. And then you have here yeah, platform as a service for developers like IBM Bluemix. You can easily, not easily, you can uh, which support. It's basically what you have as a development environment you would use to know from uh, Microsoft or Eclipse, which uh, for one computer we have similar stuff in the cloud now. And then software as a service that you all use every day when you do um, Google Mail or something. And so this stack is, I think it's, it's fair to say, it's dominated by the software layers and the infrastructure you tend to use um, commodity hardware. But all these scalability features, performance scalability features, they have to be addressed in all these layers, which is a, a significant task, of course. And the key point in cloud performance or scalability, what is a bit uh, different uh, versus other performance uh, <coughs> performance considerations is that uh, the key requirement here is uh, from the user point of view the consistent performance. So you want to have response times, for example, to deploy your systems uh, that are consistently good, not necessarily very good, but good, but they have to be independent of the time of day, of the load that is exposed against the cloud and failures in the cloud, you don't want to see this. You want to be sure you have uh, your infrastructure up and running when you want it in one or two minutes or whatever. And this is, of course, for the provider an enormous challenge. Um, so you, want, you need to provide this consistent performance, but on the other hand, you want to do this with minimal resources to make some money on <coughs> this. And this leads to the concept of elasticity. It means you want to scale your systems up and you have a lot of workload, scale down again. When there's not so much workload to save energy, etc. <coughs> and you want to come up something with uh, curves like this here. This is an example from Amazon, Genamo database where you have, uh, you see the number of uh, requests or recurring requests or incoming requests which uh, steadily grows. But the latencies uh, that uh, are observed by the end users are more or less constant. And this is what you want to have in the ideal case. So this is, if you like, a bit uh, trying to visualize the uh, elasticity concept uh, scaling up. When you have a lot of uh, requests coming in, it's scaling down again when you don't need the resources. And uh, to, to come up with such, um, to support this, this, this enormous scalability and this elasticity, you have various architectural patterns in the cloud that are very important. So for example, you have here always these horizontal scaling, this is, uh, stateless autonomous compute nodes, and here you have the auto-scaling, scale up, scale down of resources when required. You have some typical queue-centric workflow patterns, loose coupling as is called delivery of requests, and you have something what's uh, eventual consistency. Uh, we'll look at this in a minute more detail, so the, the so-called cap theory, which uh, tells you that you cannot have everything Concurrently, you cannot have this asset uh, consistency that we know from the traditional database world um, and uh, scalability at the same time, if you like. So you have to give up something, and this is done in the cloud. You give up uh, the consistency, you end up with so-called eventual consistent databases that are consistent, but sometime later, not just uh, always. And so you have here intricate interactions between the hardware and the software, which is also something to, uh, at scale, something that you need to look in 
requires a lot of inventions and a lot of research and also something where modeling and simulations uh, is, uh, is a good tool. Okay, so here we have some <coughs> software performance issues. Of course, as I said, we have here these interactions between hardware and software. This is something we have to take into uh, very carefully into account when you model. I mean, it's not, if you model clouds, it's uh, not enough to model hardware. And also, you cannot model software. Uh, you have to model the interaction between hardware and software. It means basically, <coughs> you have these uh, hardware resources. I guess most of you are a bit more hardware oriented, like bandwidth or processor cycles or uh, whatever. And then you have uh, the software constructs, especially the um, software resources like logs or credits or tokens that uh, software you need to access the hardware resources. And there's an interesting interaction between these software resources that you have to own to access the hardware resources. And uh, this is absolutely critical in the cloud. So, for example, here are some software performance issues, scalability, we had the scale-out architectures, um, and very important, we have to ensure the consistent performance as, as a function of data cardinalities, for example, users, number of VMs in the system, etc., <coughs> which is uh, already something that is not trivial, and then data access, in, in most clouds, uh, the data access is uh, um, the key point, if, if you get this wrong, then the performance uh, in cloud is spoiled already. So we have here, for example, choice of database technology, SQL versus no SQL, and asset inventory consists, etc. And very important database designs with schema, tar indices, um, then as I said, software resources, logs, tokens, connections. So for example, where you frequently use logs in the cloud is when you update uh, critical parts of the network infrastructure. Um, you need to protect uh, quite a bit of code um, by, by, by logs uh, accessible by only one process. And this is of course something that is highly non-scalable. So, uh, have to be very careful. Here's one on graph where you see um, database access in cloud, a lot of CPU cycles, little I.O. and then at this point we introduced a uh, database index, a new database index, and pattern plus turned around. Uh, so we see how important it is to have a good uh, database design and to uh, choose your indices and schemata very, very carefully. Okay, so yeah, another big problem is um, this so-called cup theory, where you have, you have several attributes of data storage in the cloud. You have here consistency, partitionability, which means you, it gets scaled out to a cluster of data, and availability, and the cup theorem basically says you can only have two of this uh, at the same time. And generally, um, the classical databases we use, uh, we, uh, used by banks and insurance companies and all these, they, they are consistent and available, but they are not really partitionable. And um, in the cloud, you want to have this because you want to go out to huge clusters, and if they give up then this consistency and replace it by eventual consistency, which means, as I said, it's not always guaranteed that your data are consistent, and then the uh, applications on top of this database they have to deal with this issue. For example, Amazon, the Amazon e-commerce is based on DynamoDB, which is not consistent, or eventually consistent only, and they deal with this. So, can I ask a question on that previous yeah. slide here? Well, the previous slide, so that you're saying like a MySQL <coughs> database, um, it's going to be consistent and available, uh, but on if I have a MongoDB database, it's it's able to be partitioned, but then it becomes not necessarily um, consistent. 
uh, or eventually consistent if the yeah. update is happening over a certain amount. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's just the technology to support that kind of that kind of um, architecture, I guess. Sorry. Uh, I mean, the, the MongoDB could support an architecture that could be partitioned. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Mm -hmm. So let's look at uh, some remarks on cloud performance simulation, some general stuff before we go to talk about our framework in detail. Um, so where could the, cl the cloud lifecycle, where could simulations and modeling <coughs> be useful? So let's look at this simple lifecycle where you start, oops, sorry, you first start designing uh, or planning a new cloud and then you implement it, you deploy it. And, and you have pro production, um, create all kinds of information, traces, box files, etc. And then you optimize, you, you find it's a uh, swoop for optimization, optimizes, etc. Uh, so I guess there are th these three points where performance simulations could be most useful. So first, at the design phase, where you can make some first estimates you think about uh, how, as, as, a, as a researcher, you may think about new algorithms, new heuristics for managing the resources in the cloud and deploying them at scale. And uh, let you say, at a classic uh, non-cloud environment, you would say, okay, no problem, we have a new algorithm, new heuristic, just let, let's test it. Uh, the problem is here, when you need to test it at uh, 80,000, the scale of 80,000 nodes or something like this, not easy to find a test bed for this. Um, so this is something to test new, uh, look, yes, to algorithm new heuristics at scale. I think this is something where you really need to uh, go for uh, performance modeling and simulations. And um, also, if you, uh, this is what you want to do as a research. I guess if you just. Uh, if you're not a researcher but you are um, a consultant or as an administrator of a cloud, what you want to do then is uh, not to look for new algorithms, new heuristics, but you want to do capacity planning. Very simple. But, um, it's not so simple, but what you want to ensure is that the workload exposed uh, against the cloud is met by the infrastructure. You can do this statically here at design planning time, but you can also use it, of course, here, if you like, dynamically scale up, scale down, and also there you can use uh, simulations and modeling to support this. Um, so th that's, that's uh, but you can do it dynamically in the ideal case, but you can also extract these uh, information from these trace and log files. Um, <coughs> to parameterize models and simulations to come up with, uh, with uh, uh, new uh, proposals how to extend to scale up or scale down the cloud to meet the workload requirements and uh, to identify bottlenecks, etc. So let's look at the side time. So who could uh, benefit from the form simulations modeling at the site time. So, so I think it's about cloud, of course, cloud designers, architects, consultants, researchers, because then you need to ensure uh, good and consistent performance to the end users. You want to do it with minimal, minimal resources. And uh, how do you do this? Depends on your role. It's about capacity planning, it's about uh, evaluating the algorithms. <coughs> And it's also about uh, evaluating the impact of upcoming hardware, for example, improved networking hardware from 10 gigabit per second to 40 or whatever, new storage, new processors. So how can you do this? I think there are quite a few frameworks around uh, in industry to doing simulation, modeling, prospectively, capacity planning. And I'm going to introduce you our stuff, which is omnet based. In minutes. Um, at runtime, <coughs> so I, uh, you can of course rely on cloud administrators, but of course much nicer is uh, the autonomous or self-adaptive uh, capacity planning. Um, same motivation as before and uh, 
So in this case, you need to adapt or integrate your model or simulation into the um, cloud uh, monitoring uh, infrastructure. And um, yeah, this is of course much more advanced and uh, our framework currently does not support this, but I guess this is something for to look into in the future to do this. <coughs> <coughs> Are you talking about using simulation in, in the loop yeah. of the actual production system? Yeah, I think that in the ideal case, I think what you want to do, <coughs> not to, to have this separately, but dynamically um, collect the data, do analysis on data, extract the parameters for the model, the modeling, and then adapt the uh, dynamically adapt the cloud capacities in the outcome. Um, this, this, I think, is something. Yeah, hmm? yeah, I think this is something you need to do for to support elasticity. Okay, so let's take a look at our simulation framework. Um, so the objectives of this framework is to <coughs> leverage the discrete event simulation te technology for cloud computing. So for the design and also what's very important, I mean, what we wanted to do is to extend the scope of uh, cloud performance engineering, measurement and tuning to larger scale. And generally, what, what, what you have is uh, you can measure performance uh, clouds, for example, deployment of VMs or uh, user workloads on a relatively small scale. And uh, because it's simply a time of uh, investment, and uh, it's, a, it's a matter of investment in time. And then what you would like to do is to, to extrapolate, so to say, how does this, uh, what does it mean for a larger system? And this is work we have done here in collaboration with some folks at Zurich. I'm sitting in the back here. Tibor is another company now. And there's some publications here. Um, Especially, we have a chapter in the um, Encyclopedia of Cloud Computing, which will be available next year. Um, okay, so the idea is very simple. We start with, um, we look at the components of the cloud. We have here the hardware components, compute nodes, CPUs, etc., network stuff, and then also, we have here software components, which are uh, here represented by virtual machines with the appropriate workflows. And then, beside this, we have the workload generators that represent, if you like, the internet in the cloud. And the idea is you um, implement these basic components, and then you simply put them together like Lego bricks to build virtual cloud in simulation, simulation models of cloud. So here you can start uh, with, uh, you have some nodes here, you have the managed VMs here, you have a cloud management VM, yeah. and uh, some, some uh, disk arrays, like I said, channel switch, etc. And here the internet workload against the cloud. So, and, and the nice thing is that uh, you can then, uh, because of various features we leverage from Omnet, uh, that you can you can start with, you know, we all know this is the year that you have this really power models in C++, then you do the modules around this and you can easily combine these modules in higher, to, to form higher modules, and these modules can put it to networks with the net language, etc. So we use this, and you can nicely combine these Lego bridges, for, uh, Lego approach, for example, to use uh, these uh, nodes here with the virtual machines. You can put several in there. You can put uh, disk arrays and switches all into one rack, and then basically, by paste and copy on omnet level, you can build a uh, data center with a lot of racks. Right? And then 
and we better connect them to the network. So that's, uh, I think it's really a, a beautiful stuff how you start with very simple models here and end up with a, like with a data center simply by combining these simple modules from large modules and then by copy and paste that will be the data center and cloud data center. And then, of course, you have to implement various workflows. And here you can repeat similar stuff. You can um, use these workflows on uh, different levels. So you, have a, you can have a high-level workflow, if you like. For example, provisioning of uh, virtual machines. You can have it on a high level, what a software view, so to say. And then these workflows just pass through the various components, like here. Uh, the software components, the virtual machines, and um, there you have to be careful to implement the software resources, like, uh, as we discussed before, like logs that had to be acquired. So you have these so-called critical sections in these workflows, which uh, uh, um, may uh, prevent scalability. So this is what you have to, where you, it's how you implement the software part of the model, and then here uh, you have the hardware components like switches, disks, etc., where you implement the contention or the arbitration for the hardware resources. And the nice thing is now, for example, if you look at here a <coughs> disk array, where we have built a disk array again out of simple, um, simpler. Um, components, for example, here we have put something like a generic switch that we can parameterize. And here a generic CPU core for the controller. And, but you can always, what you can always uh, do is to uh, uh, replace a model for this disk array by a higher level abstraction, which is not so expensive in terms of uh, Execu uh, simulation execution time which might be sufficient or you can do in more details uh, you can also here on this level uh, change the workflow the workflow what to request network or disk I will request here storage I will request do within such an array they are kicked off by the higher level workflows or the, the, or the cloud level workflow that of workflows at the various devices, and you can replace these uh, the workflows on a different level independently. Um, so it's also highly modular in this uh, sense. Uh, so here you see you have a workflow coming in on a high level, and this kicks off a uh, workflow here on a lower level. Um, so as an input, you need, uh, of course, if you, if you do some, we have something like a tuning model, so you need the resource consumption of the single requests, uh, including, of course, the arbitration, how they arbitrate for the resources. Resources means here software resources, or hardware resources. And what you get as an output are the usual performance metrics like response time, throughput, etc. So and then you can. Um, uh, basically, what we did, we, uh, yeah, we uh, in general, we exported the data and used uh, some external tools to analyze and visualize uh, the data. Um, okay, as, as mentioned already, the technology behind this is discrete event simulation technology and the tool. Uh, we use Omnest, and I don't need to say much about this, the benefits, and um, I think really um, the key, uh, I mean the key part, I, don't, I, is, is, I think I didn't uh, miss something here. Anyway, the key part that is, makes it so nice is this, uh, the, um, the capability to have these modules, combine these modules, copy paste these modules, interconnect these modules. We also use the uh, object-oriented feature of these modules, the hierarchy, 
Sets of modules, we also use of course hierarchy of the requests. We use the hierarchy in C++. So it's a, an enormous uh, rich uh, environment where basically for every simulation problem that we had, we found uh, many solutions and we can choose the best one. So <coughs> I think what, what are the highlights here? We have, um, yeah, I think it's really the scalability performance. I mean, I think it's important that the core modules are <coughs> plus plus here. And this uh, script language can be supporting parallel simulations. We did not yet in this context use it, but I think it's good to know that when you reach uh, the ceiling on one node, you have the opportunity to go to more than one node. Um, yeah, what is important here, I mentioned this, but here it's really important that you, you cloudy treat all components as first class citizens. I mean, it's different, I uh, think, what you have uh, in many, uh, I think there's an enormous amount of modeling done in the network domain where you look at network stacks and switches, routers, and all this. But then, uh, you don't really take into account other components like the nodes, or especially the software, what's going on in the software, in the VMs, what's going on at the storage, and the cloud consists of all these ingredients, and to have a good cloud modeling and simulation, of course, you should treat them as well as first-class citizens. And also what's nice, uh, talked about this before, you have here you can use very high level cost grain modeling. So, for example, we also have uh, uh, simple modules for simple fuel modeling. So, if you like, you can start with very simple fuel modeling and then go for fine, more fine grain modeling for more details later. And so, you have both the possibility to do fast prototyping and you can do. If you basically you can do it with arbitrary accuracy where required. Of course, it takes uh, it's up uh, implementation resources and, and, and runtime resources, but um, the principles are possible. So let's apply this to uh, OpenStack image deployment. Um, so what you wanted to do here is to estimate. Uh, the end-to-end -end image deployment performance for various uh, OpenStack cloud architectures, identify bottlenecks and for various architecture load combinations, and provide some guidance for OpenStack cloud and OpenStack performance. Work. So what we did is we um, parameterized the beta discrete event simulation, we parameterized and calibrated this by available measurements that we had internally. And then we um, went beyond these uh, measurement data and uh, modeled other systems, OpenStack systems. But the key <coughs> point is that we used these, always focus on the relative result versus this baseline. Um, I think it's much more difficult to go for absolute numbers. And it's I think it's the right approach, or the much more safer, and I think maybe the only reasonable approach here is to go for relative numbers, that you have a baseline, which is verified by measurements, you can calibrate by simulation with this, and then once you uh, have some trust that at least the baseline is uh, simulated correctly, then you can go and beyond this and like always uh, interpret your, your numbers, the simulation of numbers relative to this baseline. And of course, you, if you have more than one baseline or more than one set of measurement data, you can do several calculations, that's even better. <coughs> so here we started with the old stuff on one node, one is, uh, component, so we have the in the cloud, you have in general, you distinguish between the managed from system and the managed to components. Um, so we put all the OpenStack stuff in the managed to components in one node. And we attach this to this uh, switch. And 
then we get another scenario where we have here uh, one managed from node and um, 200 managed to nodes with the over compute and the hypervisor on it, mm, which is <coughs> already a small data center. And uh, then we, uh, I think here is, uh, we split up the managed from nodes also. And we had to produce a hierarchy of oxygen. So these scenarios we had, and um, okay, here this is the workflow that we have implemented. So this is something where you, if you want to do this uh, simulation approach in detail, um, the more you need, of course, a lot of knowledge of the workflow, which might not always be available. In this case, we had quite as uh, detailed um, knowledge of the workflow of such a provisioning uh, request. You see how the, oops, how the component, all the OPSTEC components are involved, and here you see especially also where you have to have some locking. Um, and uh, here again, locking, especially when you do some, uh, you configure some network stuff. Um, okay, this is what components are involved in what workload phases. And um, so what we did here is we used this uh, semen request measurement data to parameterize a uh, simulation. And then we uh, um, also had some concurrent request measurement for calibration. So senior request for parameterization, concurrent request measurement data for calibration. So we started here with a single with available measurement. So we had uh, one nice work uh, from Peter Feiner, presented its open stack summit um, 2013. Uh, and we had some IBM internal data. And then, as I said, we focused on the relative values versus this baseline to factor out uh, systems with some system-specific features. Um, OK, and we. Um, then, of course, then enhance the model once we have more data. So here you see, for example, um, the bike, uh, bike arrival request, where we have uh, this is about the, the calibration, you see the simulation and the measurements. And here um, we had already the parameterization by single request. And this is about validation, which is uh, up to this level quite OK. And then um, we identified uh, several simulation scenarios. Here, basically all uh, operation uh, OS deployment workflow related. And um, then we uh, are here some, some characteristics uh, of such a execution of such a scenario. Um, the, the key number here is how many, in omelet, how many events per second you get on such a thing that, which is a very good number. In simple is what you see, I guess, Wolfgang in other simulations. So. So, and then we have here the simulation results. Mm. So what we did here is we increased the number of concurrent deployment requests. So we increased the load <coughs> against the um, cloud. And then you see, for example, how the throughput, the deployment throughput, how this increased here linearly until saturation. Um, for these multi-node scenarios and the single node will end up very soon in saturations. Um, we can normalize these two ports. And um, so you, then you can ask, uh, so it's uh, overall um, what happened? Why is it not, not much better? Where are the problems? And then you can measure the response times. And um, 
they show basically the same problem. So you have a significant increase in response times on the single cloud. Um, and then you can look at various details, which is, you know, of course, much easier in simulations and real systems. So for example, here you can look at the uh, two links. Oops. So you can look at the two links for locks at the hypervisor. So for a single node, you see that here, basically the scalability on a single node is not limited by hardware, it's limited by software. Because they, on the request, you have to queue up for the software artifact on the slots. If you go then, um, uh, you can, for example, try, okay, let's say, for example, we turn this, uh, Lock it off and do this easily in simulation. Of course, in the real world, this would be a disaster because it would be resulting to wrong code. Um, in this case, then you see that the, uh, um, um, the contention for the blue cycles uh, in its current uh, scalability. And then um, you can go for, um, um, you, can go to, you can look at the uh, processor utilization again, or the management processor core, you no know, issues. Um, you can look at the disk external utilizations. Um, so, where you see that, that, that then you, run, you start to run into issues. So the key point here is the observation that is of open stack. You start with the, uh, um, with on one node, that's more the software resources that limit uh, your scalability. And then once you scale up to a larger system, um, <coughs> and it's more the uh, hardware resources that limit the scalability. Okay, so let's come here to a summary. Um, so what, let's try to sum up our experience here for the <coughs> cloud performance modeling simulation. So I think it's fair to say that it has a significant potential to evaluate new software, heuristics, hardware infrastructure, especially at scale, which are not easily accessible for testing. Uh, Omnet is a very good basis for these uh, simulations here. Uh, and uh, I think there are also some issues that uh, need to be addressed to make this uh, simulation, cloud modeling simulation, really successful. It's the first thing is that uh, the cloud, uh, especially cloud software, is a very fast moving target. So the question is how can you adapt your simulation, your model? this very fast moving target. Then the next point is that um, you want to do simulation at scale, but then the problem is um, you need to know what artifacts, what resources, uh, either software or hardware resources are really important at scale. And this is not easy to see because uh, if you look at small systems, they they don't appear really to be important. I mean, uh, they show up only when you have uh, large systems and a lot of load. So this is something which is not easy to identify what needs to be included in simulation and what not to make reliable uh, projections at scale. Like another issue is that, you, as we have seen in the open state case, that you need to obtain uh, workflow details and you need to have measurement results to parameterize uh, your model and uh, simulation. Where do you get this from? Uh, not always, not easy. In many cases, you don't have these uh, details and you cannot really do a modeling approach. Um, then another thing is you depends on, on, on your goals, but uh, to make it 
useful for a wider audience, not only for researchers. So you need to have some kind of um, UI or interfacing, some higher level abstractions. You need to maybe you need to make it available as a service, cloud performance related as a service, or cloud capacity planning as a service. Something like this. That's, uh, currently, our framework is certainly too much uh, oriented to researchers and developers. But this, I mean, you could do this on top. I mean, I think we have a solid technology kernel, but this needs to, to be done. So, I think what are the, the the outlook here, and the more research and development is required to address the issues mentioned. And then I guess the key point is that you need to, if you have the simulation modeling in the cloud, you need to seamlessly integrate this with the cloud monitoring logging tools. And um, also so to, to, to get the data, you need to feed the model. And then you, you need to integrate it with cloud resource orchestration composition tools that you can automatically uh, translate the modeling simulation results into real actions to scale up, to scale it down the cloud. Okay. okay. Thank you. To so start the presentation a little bit later, we can have a a couple of questions. Sure, sure. Um, still. Mm -hmm. yes. How do you plan to evaluate the, the scalability measurement of your simulation? Uh, uh, in fact, uh, we cannot. I mean, we don't yeah. have. We didn't have a test bed that could uh, uh, for available to to validate this uh, hundred nodes uh, statements. This was not possible. We just had the small, the small uh, node available to. Then they can do it in a real scalability. I mean, so you use uh, all this obstructor stuff. You can really do the scale, scaling out and scaling in each and the, and the purpose of the simulation is to to, to see how the performance come when you have a large number of returns. Yeah. But then yeah, in the end, you cannot uh, from this work, you cannot really check. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, you can check if you have such a system, but at the time we didn't have it. So. Okay. I was wondering on the uh, last slide of the future work, uh, that you want to make the system accessible for uh, non-experts. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so who else would be interested, actually, except for developers of cloud systems and uh, <coughs> researchers? Is there another target audience? Well, I think for I mean, what what frequently what is uh, frequently happening, and there are already some tools available, and I guess this would be you know, a bit better than what we have available. Is uh, I mean, you technical results. I mean, you you want to sell the cloud, or you want to. Sell and then people ask you, and you go to the customer and ask, okay, so how many users you expect on the cloud? And, uh, and then they say, they, they, we don't know. Uh, and then you use this tool to collect something. Um, mm -hmm. but, I mean, it's a difficult process. They don't know how many, what about the workload, so you have to guess the workload. And then, but if you, if you have such a tool with a nice uh, abstraction, uh, um, and for example, people think in generally um, in cloud space um, concurrently active VMs. Uh, and then you can ask what is a typical VM doing in terms of CPU cycles, IOPS, and network traffic. You can come up, can up, can come up with some guesses here. And if you have such an abstraction of active concurrent VMs, and then you can um, build a UI on top of this. Uh, using this abstraction to give in these numbers and then the simulation engine tells you about the hardware um, the hardware uh, required to support this. Okay. So pre-sales or consultants or mm -hmm. whoever needs to plan, design the cloud would use this, but not in a way that researcher would do. Yeah, I can definitely see that. But uh, I was usually thinking that uh, we don't sell, or you don't sell a single cloud, but like we're in the system and if it runs too slow, then 
or you buy a second one integrated it's the cloud so yeah but i, can definitely see yeah, that I mean if you performance estimations it's very important yeah i mean you um, Let's say you have a company of 10,000 employees and you want to move your IT to a cloud, mm -hmm. then I mean, you can be pretty sure that one node is not good enough. And uh, you don't want, I mean, it's not possible to say, ah, we start with one node, we see it's not enough at a second until, I mean, people want to have good performance from day one, so to say. But it's, I mean, it's the case that the cloud operator has to care about this. If I'm operating it, it's not really a cloud, it's like my own system then. Cloud, as least my definition is like, there's a cloud operator like Amazon Google so far. And yeah, I, I mean this is uh, exactly, so I mean basically they have to use it. Or yeah. uh, I mean there are also a lot of private clouds within companies, I mean or cloudified data centers, they have to yeah. use it. Uh, or, or people who want to sell to mm. uh, cloud data centers, uh, they, they have to use it. But as an end user, of course, you just expect it as it works. Mm. Do you also simulate energy consumption? No, that's a good question. I mean, that's it, uh, something that we, we thought about, how to do this, or if we should do this, but this, I guess, would be highly interesting. I mean, you can, of course, do also with capacity planning, or with energy consumption, a simple spreadsheet-like approach. I mean, you add up all the maximum energy, energy consumptions for all the components, and then you have a number but probably it would be interesting to have some dynamic uh, view of this. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think it would be interesting to do. Yeah, well, what, are your, what do your <coughs> workload generators look like in this environment and, and how did you model the software that was running on each node? Uh, what abstraction level do you like? Yeah, basically, so the workload generator was just uh, <coughs> in the uh, uh, for example, was the deployment, a closed stream of deployment requests, so wrap, uh, uh, wrap up phase, or then I had a constant load of these uh, deployments and then a ramp down. And uh, the work I think to model the, the, the software workloads, I think the key point is um, so you, you have these, you have to know basically how much. Uh, CPU or part of CPU is a workload request consuming a deployment. Uh, in this phase, I don't know, uh, one core or something like this. And, and you, have, you can model a 12 core system and then, okay, this, this request eats up one core for 30 seconds or so. So this is the approach we use. And then um, in the critical section, I just start with these blocks. I can add. Ah, yeah. <coughs> uh, yeah, this is how you model the software, pretty, the logs in software. So you have uh, yeah, such a pool of tokens, and you acquire such a token when you come in, and then you have here the critical section software, you release it, and uh, other uh, things you require. So basically, it's always. Uh, Heating up cores, so it's a, if you like, for example, hardware resources, and then um, acquiring <coughs> software resources to be allowed to access the hardware resources. And this interplay that's all. This is my Thanks. Thanks. Actually, uh, one question that um, ties into that in terms of the, the, the level of uh, abstraction. So, in the morning, we had a session on, on the INET. Uh, framework. Uh, you could have started, at least say for the networking uh, part of this, <coughs> with, with something like, like INET. But if I look at this one chart where you showed the match, so for the calibration, the match between, uh, it was a small case, I guess, maybe sing, single nodes, but the match between the, the measurements and, and your model, it looked to match really well. And it seemed that the abstraction level you have here is much higher than what you would get with yeah. something like INET. <coughs> But then you ask yourself the question, you know, why bother with something like INET? If, if for this level of, of, of performance uh, <coughs> definition, that, that high abstract level is, 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 is good enough because the bottlenecks are entirely uh, somewhere else. I mean, it depends on what you want to do. Uh, it, it's, I think INET has certainly its value if you want to look in detail at the um, queuing of bottlenecks within the network stack, which makes a lot of sense. I, and, and 
but I guess I had we not scaled to thousands of, of nodes and thousands of switches or whatever, or 10,000, I mean, they cannot use it. I mean, same what we do processor modeling, I mean, it has a lot of value to do this, but in this context, it's too detailed, and, and then he um, doesn't help you, I guess, because, I mean, you, you have to, I think, it's, it's uh, when you do this modeling or simulation on this cloud level, you have to address the typical issues that these uh, folks on cloud level ask. And they don't ask about the, uh, of, um, bottlenecks or issues in the network stack. Or they want to know uh, what, how many, do I have to add more nodes, to s or do I have to add more uh, storage, or sure. do I have software issues that uh, I cannot even use the resources, uh, and uh, how much concurrent uh, active VMs are supported. And they think in different uh, objects that uh, have to appear in this modeling approach. Okay, any other final questions? Otherwise, we can break for, uh, for lunch. <laughs>